Hello and welcome to Dialogue. China has added several U.S. companies to the unreliable entity list over their involvement in arms sales to Taiwan, China region. The same day when the newly elected leader of Taiwan took office, what is the policy of the new administration in Taiwan on the cross-strait relations? Will the relations get better or fare worse in the years to come? And how will Beijing respond to Taiwan and also the U.S. arms sales to Taiwan? Join us for our discussion today from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are Joanna Lei, former KMT legislator in Taiwan and a Tangen senior fellow at Taihe Institute, and Victor Gao, Zhikai chair professor, Suzhou University. Uh, welcome to Dialogue. Uh, Joanna, I will start with you. So uh, now there's a speech uh, by the new leader in Taiwan, Lai Qingde. So what's your takeaway? I think there are three things that's very, very noteworthy. One is he bookended a new definition or interpretation of what Taiwanese is. He started by saying 1949 as the beginning when Taiwan plunged into the dark era of authorization or authoritarian rule, which was the time, of course, KMT um, regime started in Taiwan, and ended by saying that we should celebrate Taiwan's 400 years history starting from 1624. And I think that sentence may be lost by many uh, accounts. 1624 is when Dutch established the colonial rule in Taiwan, and they started that in Tainan. So from Tainan, Lai Xingde said, starting from 19, 1624, Taiwan has sailed into globalization, and 1949 was a dark era, and he's writing that wrong in his sense. And then secondly, he has used new packages for the old two-state theory. But I think while the rhetoric or the playbook may be different, the theme was extremely consistent. So we should look at the new package, such as peace and world peace, but we should not forget the essence of what he has proposed. In between lines, the two-state theory was really clear. And the last point is his language towards mainland China, PRC, was surprisingly harsh. I think it surprised, it took a lot of us by surprise. Such a harsh rhetoric and the way he depicted mainland China's attitudes toward Taiwan, I think will not be lost by all the analysts internationally. While we understand that most of the speeches were previewed by the United States, we were truly wondering whether the United States is endorsing his harshness towards PRC. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Victor, uh, let's start with uh, you know, the response from the mainland here, the Taiwan Office uh, of the State Council uh, pointed out, I think that's uh, partly in response to you know, what's the source of the tension, what's the source of the complicated uh, situation across the street right now. Of course, you know, Lai, in his speech, he blamed the mainland for the tension entirely, basically. Um, tell us what really happened probably over the past, uh, let's say, under Tsai ing eight years. First of all, uh, for the eight years of Tsai ing uh, government in Taiwan, as well as for Lai ching uh, government starting today, uh, we need to emphasize one thing. That is, to promote Taiwan separatism is itself anti-peace. It is really undermining and sabotaging peace across the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. So they are taking initiatives to uh, break away from China. And the rhetoric that Taiwan and the PRC have never been subjugated to each other is completely wrong. Because if you listen very carefully, it's very similar to the Confederation claiming that it is not subjugated to the uh, United States of America. It's a kind of declaration of war in a sense, and it is very dangerous. And I don't think the rhetoric adopted by Lai Jingwen can fool the people in Taiwan all the time. It cannot fool the international community at any time. And it will not fool the 1.4 billion people on two sides of the Taiwan Strait. I hope he will do some homework to study history. 
I hope you will know the real significance, as the previous analyst mentioned, of 1624. It is not a date of glory for the people of Taiwan. It was the date of colonization by the Dutch across the distance of the vast ocean to Taiwan to try to uproot the local people. And I would say, if Lai Chinda is 100% uh, indoctrinated in the way he described the Taiwan, it is a dead end. It will lead to war between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. And his false hope of peace prevailing on the two sides of the Taiwan Strait will lead the people astray because it will shake the foundation of the One China policy and it will really raise alarm in many quarters in the world because that is not the way to preserve peace across the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. That is not the way to make sure that the people in Taiwan will enjoy prosperity, stability, and continue the prospect of growth. And this is exactly what the two sides of the Taiwan Strait will need the least because it is not a recipe for peace and development and cooperation across the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. Lai mm -hmm. Ching today, by making his speech, is declaring that China's mainland is its enemy. And this is a recipe not for peace. It is just for the opposite of peace. Mm -hmm. Well, Anna, what do you make of this, you know, his reference of uh, like somehow Taiwan's history started, uh, starting like 16, 24. You know, we usually when we talk about the Taiwan question, we know like Taiwan would return to China, you know, uh, with the defeat of the Japanese uh, imperialists uh, in 1945. And of course, in 1949, since then, we talked about the Taiwan question in 1970s, you know, when China and U.S. established formal diplomatic ties, right? Yeah, I actually look at it more from the perspective of uh, when China became independent and the Seventh Fleet was parked off of Taiwan, in essence, preventing uh, the full reunification of China. That was the U.S. Um, and I agree with uh, what Joanna said. He's uh, definitely a revisionist. Uh, he wants to rewrite history um, in a very odd way. Uh, I don't know exactly what he's getting at. He, it, it doesn't make any sense, as both Victor and Joanna have said. But, you know, let's, let's put this in perspective. This is a chap who received 40% of the votes. He does not have a majority in the uh, parliament. Uh, and we witnessed yesterday, you know, the fist fights and uh, his party charging the podium and taking documents, running away. And uh, if this is the face of democracy in Taiwan, it's somewhat shameful. Uh, this isn't the first time it's happened. But if this is the beginning, um, it doesn't bode well. The other thing that you should notice is that he is now in a position where he almost has to rely on the United States. He doesn't have a popular mandate. The only thing he has is whether or not the U.S. is going to kind of bankroll uh, whatever projects he has. And the, the last part is he, he you know, likes to talk about history, but he, he doesn't want to talk about recent history. The fact that in 1992, when the consensus was reached, there was a flood of of pro-Taiwanese policies on the mainland that allowed a tremendous amount of uh, economic opportunity. As 2019, 40% uh, of Taiwan's economy was directly or indirectly related to the mainland, and 10% of the workforce worked on the mainland. Those were benefits that were received based on a bargain that was made. But he doesn't seem to remember that. I mean, this is what we, in the United States, we call welshing on an agreement. Uh, he, he has put it out of his mind because the benefits are there. But long term, I doubt that he's going to be able to maintain it. Remember, in the last two uh, interim elections, his party was soundly beaten because they do not have a recipe for economic um, growth in Taiwan. And that is going to continue to be his weak point. But it is, I would agree with um, both my uh, colleagues, it is very, very dangerous that he feels he can only, um, you know, adhere to U.S. policies and look for favor from them. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Joanna, you know, indeed, in his speech, he had talked about, uh, you know, people of the Republic of China and uh, the you know, official name of Taiwan, Republic of China, 
uh, they are not subordinate to each other. You know, he calls for the mainland to recognize, basically, you know, Republic of China, uh, meaning you know Taiwan is an independent state under the constitution. At the same time, he failed to mention that you know under uh, the constitution in Taiwan that there is only one China. You know, there are two regions within this China, Taiwan and the mainland. So there is still the one China, uh, a lot like in the 1992 consensus. Uh, you know, why? Was he, or is he avoiding that mention uh, of the fact of the reality? I think it is clearly very carefully chosen speeches. In order to make Taiwan issue an international issue, he cannot allow Taiwan to be a domestic affairs between two different governments. So he will continue to push from Li Denghui onwards the special state-to-state -state relationship or the so-called two-state theory. That is to make Taiwan an international issue. Therefore, if there were any issue or any confrontation potentially, and I hope not, that there is sufficient reason to call for international intervention. He, this time, has, has advanced that theory by saying Taiwan is the uh, frontier of democracy, and safeguarding peace and stability, thereby preserving prosperity worldwide, and adding Taiwan is a critical part of global supply chain. So this economic dimension is added onto the traditional political discussion, but overall it's the same theory. You have different rhetoric, but the theory is the same, the playbook, the major theme is the same. That is, DPP wants to make Taiwan an international issue. Hopefully, that will give them, quote unquote, international intervention. Mm, international intervention from, from whom? Uh, certainly from his speeches, and today his gesture will be from the United States and Japan, primarily two states. Mm. Well, uh, Lai Chin uh, Joanna, you know, is, you know, is known or used to say, you know, he's a pragmatic worker for Taiwan independence. During the campaign, you know, he's sort of uh, turning down that kind of rhetoric. Um, but, you know, looking at his speech, do you think he's changing his mind or, you know, has he changed that at all? Not at all. Lai Chin is a very stubborn politician. I worked with him at Le Legislative Yuan when I was there. And his typical response is if you give him more pressure, he would push back. And here you have different ways of describing the so-called pragmatic Taiwan independence worker. But if you look at his um, pillars of peace and stability, for example, he has invented a rhetoric that allow him not to say Taiwan independence, but insisted on its essence de facto. Mm, de facto. Uh, Victor, indeed, he talked about, uh, you know, like status quo. But, but do you think, you know, the status quo, in the words of Lai Ching De, is the same, you know, when the mainland talked about the status quo, at least for, for some people, you know, like for, you know, from the mainland point of view, you know, status quo means like 1992 consensus. There's only one China. That is a status quo. You know, there's Taiwan, there's the mainland that's under one China. But for Lai Ching De, it seems sounds a lot like you know Taiwan is an independent state, and that is the status quo. We should continue with that. What do you make of his talk of a status quo here? You know, I would urge Lai Ching De and his team to really study history. You do not need to go further. For example, as they did 1624, they just need to go back to the Cairo Declaration and the Potsdam Proclamation, which formed the pillars of the post-Second World War international order. In both documents, it clearly dictated that Japan, which occupied Taiwan from 1895 to 1945, 45. need to surrender Taiwan back to China as one of the preconditions of Japan's unconditional surrender. And that's what Japan did, surrendering Taiwan back to China meaning there was only one China and Taiwan became part of China. Uh, therefore, for whatever uh, justifications, whatever name reasons, etc., that they want to come up with, it cannot stand the truth. It cannot stand the test of realities. And basically, by promoting Taiwan as a sovereign, independent state, separate from China and he is not talking about PRC versus, for example, 
uh, Republic of China, because if you really go to the real uh, legal status of the relations between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait, it is the unfinished civil war back in 1949. So what does he want? Does he want the resurrection of the unfinished civil war? And does he really believe that anyone in the world, including the United States, really want to get involved in the refleshed up civil war between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait? Does he really believe that Japan, which unconditionally surrendered in 1945 and is obligated by its instrument of unconditional surrender in 1945, would ever have any right to get involved in a situation across the two sides of the Taiwan Strait? I think Lai ching and his team are either brain dead or they try to be as sophisticated as possible but their sophistication cannot stand the light of the sun. And that is the crux of the matter. If they push in that direction, there is only one way. That is to destroy peace across the two sides of the Taiwan Strait, to plunge the people in Taiwan into abyss, for example, and before the dust really settles, their so-called independence of Taiwan will be really rushed and brushed into the dustbin of history. Taiwan will never be an independent sovereign country. Taiwan will always be part of China. That is the mega trend. Wake up, Lai ching Don't really bash your head upon this rock of history. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Anna, earlier you mentioned about, you know, since 1992 consensus, uh, which means like one China, basically. And then there's a booming trade and people to people exchange across mm -hmm. the street. And then, you know, what is the source of attention of the current uh, situation? You know, pretty much a lot of attention uh, between the two sides. Uh, what happened over the pa past eight plus years? Well, uh, it wasn't over the past eight years. I mean, it was prior to a time away. She was uh, the symptom of uh, some friction between there. And then there's, there are a number of reasons. Um, there, were, there was a flood of Chinese uh, who visited Taiwan. There was a feeling that uh, the Taiwanese said, oh, we're not like that. Uh, today, you couldn't tell the difference. I mean, the uh, fact is that uh, mainland has become very, very sophisticated. But it did create this kind of wedge issue. Uh, if you really, from my perspective, you should look at entities like the National Endowment for Democracy, which is funded by the U.S. Congress and directed by the U.S. Congress, which is involved in regime change. They're very active in uh, Taiwan as they were in Hong Kong. And their issue is always the same, that every country has to become uh, some sort of version of the United States. Uh, that means a liberal democratic um, uh, democ a capitalist society. It hasn't worked. Uh, and in, you know, in these instances, and all it has done is, if you look at Arab Spring and so many other areas where it has failed, it has just brought uh, chaos, death, turmoil uh, are all around. So uh, I, it's, it's unfathomable to me that even though he is very stubborn, that lie would think that having uh, a re repetition of what happened in Ukraine or what has happened in Africa, other parts of the Middle East, and South America, is somehow uh, in the best interests of Taiwan. And, and that's really the crux of this. Why is he walking down this road? Yes, he's politically weak. He feels he has to uh, do whatever he thinks the United States wants. Um, and he, I think he feels that the U.S. wants to keep the pot boiling, uh, but not boiling over. Uh, but this is not in the interest of Taiwan, and it's going to become apparent as, as uh, the mainland loses patience. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Joanna, you know, with all we talked about, uh, you know, Lai ching did in his speech, he talked about uh, you know, resumption of uh, tourism and also uh, of education exchanges across the street. Uh, you know, did he mean it? Oh, uh, you know, how, can, how, how do we should it take that kind of a stance? You know, is he really uh, suggesting the resumption of uh, normal exchanges uh, across the street? Or is that kind of like a facade, uh, you know, uh, or deceptive even to the international community? 
I think overall he wants to present himself as a peace-loving person facing an extremely strong and powerful adversary across Taiwan Strait. So he needs to be rational and peace-loving. In this whole paragraph of future potential exchanges opening some doors, his precondition is mainland China will have to engage with the legally elected government in Taiwan. I think that's the real important subtext. He wanted to make sure that he has a direct link with mainland China and have an ability to talk with his counterparts across the Taiwan Straits. Without any friendly gesture, he has never achieved, um, he has no hope of achieving that, such as in the eight years of Tsai Ing-wen, when she didn't answer the 92 consensus question, she had no door open at all, even though she keeps saying that we were open to dialogue discussion. So Tsai Ing-wen and Lai Qingde are the same. They're trying to create an opportunity, an opening of a door, so that they can continue to present to the people in Taiwan that they can manage mainland China relationship and have the ability to maintain status quo. Uh, so you know, given all we talked about, Joanna, what's the public in Taiwan? Uh, what's their response to uh, Lai's speech? Um, our stock market plunged after his speech, and of course, at the end, it pulled back. I think the uh, state money got in so that it doesn't look too bad. I think the stock market represented a very visceral reaction to his speech. I am totally surprised by the harshness of his tone towards mainland China and PRC. So I think a lot of people in Taiwan are worried about the harshness of his tone will lead to a potential confrontation. A potential confrontation, of course, uh, you know, speak of that, there's the involvement uh, of the United States. Uh, and I earlier mentioned about um, uh, US, uh, you, you know, we mentioned about arms sale to Taiwan. The US promised in one of the protocol with uh, uh, China that the uh, U.S. will reduce arms sales to Taiwan until the point of no arms sales. But uh, in reality, what we are seeing is the U.S. increase arms sales to Taiwan day by day. And also, you know, like uh, Lai Ching in his speech, uh, seems like he uh, would like to play along with what uh, you know, Biden has said, basically, you know, oh, this is a fight between democracy and autocracy. He said Taiwan is at the frontier mm -hmm. of democracy. Uh, what do you make all of that? Uh, you know, somehow, you know, is that getting the situation better or is that worsening the secure situation in the region? Well, of course, it's worsening the situation. I mean, uh, the U.S. has been looking for an entry point into uh, Asia. Uh, obviously, the Philippines is one. Uh, Taiwan is the other. Um, they've been, you know, forming uh, AUKUS, the Quad, etc. Uh, these are all extremely warlike moves. These are the same things that were happening during World War I. Uh, China is trying to respond uh, and make sure that he, d he doesn't walk into the trap of World War I where you, you know, create these alliances. But Taiwan is a completely different issue. It is regarded, it is in the Constitution, it is part of China. It should have been handed over a long time ago. There could have been, uh, you know, there have been numerous offers to have uh, some sort of di difference where it's one country with different systems. Um, but that has gone nowhere. There has been no t talk in that things. And I think what Joanna said is very telling. There has been absolutely no hand put out by Tai Wei and her son. They're, they're trying to uh, normalize this idea that Taiwan has always been independent, which was the whole point of his revisionist history. But it isn't true. And, you know, it's, it's what's surprising is that once again, we're going to be facing a possible conflict because somebody wants to reinvent history. Uh, well, reinventing history, um, speak of that. Uh, uh, Victor, we know that uh, in the UN there was a resolution uh, which speaks clearly that uh, there's only one China, Taiwan is part of it, and Beijing is a legal, is the only legal representative of China there. But recently in the US uh, uh, Congress, basically, you know, some people are talking about, oh, there's a mischaracterization of that UN resolution. What's the intention here? Why there's such a talk at all in the first place? 
Well, in that famous uh, UN resolution, which uh, uh, produced the kind of trinity of the one China policy, that is, there is only one China and Taiwan is part of China. The PRC government is the sole legitimate representative of the totality of China. Uh, there was no mention of Taiwan or the Republic of China. The real reference was uh, Chiang Kai-shek's regime. But we know for sure what is that Chiang Kai-shek's regime, is that right? And for anyone in the U.S. Congress try to reinvent history is, again, revealing their ignorance and also their futility or their attempt try to uh, change the course of history. The uh, megatrend is there is only one China and Taiwan is part of China. And in the world of today, more than 183 countries recognize the PRC as the sole legitimate government of China. And there is a dozen or so countries which still recognize the Republic of China. However, allow me to emphasize one single most important point. That is, there is no country, no international organization at all, which can recognize both PRC on the one hand and Taiwan on the other hand, because that will be an extreme violation of the one China policy, and that will never be tolerated. Uh, therefore, I think for those members of the U.S. Uh, Congress, again, at the uh, deep of the night, they really need to expose their real motivation. What exactly do they want? Do they want peace across the two sides of the Taiwan Strait? Or do they want to use Taiwan as a proxy to achieve their uh, geopolitical goals, for example, which are futile in themselves. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I think between China and the United States, we really need to engage with each other as to what exactly is up to the United States. What exactly do they want? They cannot say one thing and talk the talk and walk the different walk, for example, because that will really lead towards a very dangerous, explosive, confrontational situation which will not be in the best interest of the American people or the Chinese people. Yes. And mm -hmm. I think we really need to honor the legacy of the late Dr. Henry Kissinger, who back in 1971 came up with this very, very uh, ingenious reference as the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. Okay. Now, the two sides of the Taiwan Strait need peace rather than sabotage. Mm -hmm. And pushing for Taiwan's independence is a direct violation of the one China policy and will destroy peace across the two sides of the two Taiwan Strait. Yes. Uh, Anna, you were shaking your hand about uh, this, you know, uh, you know, like a reinvention of history in the U.S. Congress about Taiwan. Tell us more about that. You have one minute. Yeah, I, I, it, it is. I mean, history is being re reinvented everywhere uh, in Israel, uh, in Japan, Taiwan, the United States. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to revisit the history of the 400 um, treaties that we violated uh, with the American Indians when we took their lands. Um, but, you know, it is it is really dangerous. This is what you had when we had uh, uh, Germany. Uh, it was you know, you, you had liter, literally reinventing history, uh, creating some sort of myth, and that's exactly what you have. I'm not equating a uh, lie with Hitler. I'm just saying that the process of reinventing history leads to conflict, because it, you make claims that aren't true, and those who, who see them as untrue resist. And the U.S., by arming Taiwan in the midst of this revisionism, is extremely explosive. I agree with Victor on that. But, you know, going back to what Joanna said, you know, w yeah. what is the point of all of this? He's, there's no end game for him. This mm -hmm. harshness of his tone is not going to help uh, uh, the economy of Taiwan, which is right. his uh, administration's weak point. Yes. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGT app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next week.